So uh, yeah, I run the Flatiron School. Um, how many people are familiar with what that is? Cool, so we were one of like the first boot camps. Um, I'm a self-taught developer. Um, I've been programming professionally for like 15 years. Um, I had a startup um, like seven years ago that I ran for four years and I was kind of burnt out programming. Uh, and I started teaching kind of just to take a year off. I had exited the startup. I was kind of didn't want to like do another product startup for a while. I started teaching, I got really into teaching. I started getting my students jobs. And then it kind of just like snowballed into like the Flatiron School. So at this point, we're graduating around 450 developers a year. We have a 99% placement rate. When I say that, our, our sets are audited, so you're gonna hear a lot of boot camps tell you about their placement rates. So like one boot camp, like say 99% like of our students are employed. And by that, they mean not unemployed. Not necessarily employed as developers, just simply after you're graduating, they still have a job, which is not like what people paid for. So we take our outcomes really seriously. We're super iterative about how we teach, and uh, we've been doing it for like four years, so whatever you feel about boot camps, just we have around 600 alumni in the city that are developers for the past three and a half years, so however, whatever we're doing, it kind of works. Um, in the last uh, two and a half years, we had to deal with like, as, as, as we wanted to keep the quality up, but we couldn't have just me run all of the courses and teach, we had to figure out how to like kind of scale our quality which is something we've taken really seriously and really slowly. And uh, we kind of started coming up on like all these different little pieces of where software could help us teach better. Um, and eventually over the last like year and a half, we started productizing these ideas into an educational platform that we call Learn. So we've actually been using this internally um, in the school for like a year to help run our courses and keep quality up and be able to get metrics on how people are learning. And over the last six months, we've actually opened this up to like a remote boot camp experience. So now we have around 250 students enrolled in Flatiron Online, which we call like Learn. So they're running through the same curriculum that we teach every day at Flatiron. They're just doing it at their own pace, remotely online, with very minimal instructor support. Um, and uh, I kind of want to show you guys a little bit about like our pedagogy, about why we think online education has been kind of like a big miss and what we're doing a little differently in terms of teaching programming online. Um, and I really just want to kind of hear your thoughts and like feedback on like, you know, the efficacy of like our ideas about how to teach programming online. Um, so this is kind of what Learn looks like. And, uh, you know, you have like a track, so this is full stack web development, and you kind of see all the topics it covers, right? So this is like kind of procedural Ruby, and it goes into like RMs and Sinatra and Rails and all these other topics. Um, this is a readme on Learn, so you know, this is a, kind of about like how loops work, and if you're a beginner, that's kind of like a thing. And you read about loops, and you kind of understand like what's going on. And like the first thing that like we think is different about the way we teach programming, or the way we teach anything online, is if, you know, most, most online places like, you know, Udemy, Udacity, they're all videos. And in my experience, videos are a terrible way to learn how to program, especially as a beginner, because programming is like syntax and specificity, and you gotta focus and pay attention to every detail. And it's very easy to watch a video and be doing something else and not pay attention to syntax. We expect people to read all day and then to write all day and not watch things in the sense that, like, you know, I think if writing, if being a programmer is reading and writing code all day, the way you should learn that is probably similar to that. And I remember when we were developing the curriculum, my curriculum manager, when I would write these like massive readmes about loops, she would be like, wow, you expect people to read a lot. I'd be like, yeah, it's programming, read a lot. So the idea of kind of the platform is that like, you know, you're reading this and you get a sense of what loops are, and then like, you know, you mark it as done, move on to the next lesson. And then eventually you get to these lessons that are like labs. And this is kind of like the big difference. Um, in like kind of how we teach online, if you've ever played with like Code Academy, you're probably used to like these ideas of REPLs that are these really contrived environments. And I get that from like a product perspective, I wanna make my product easy to use. But a problem with education is that if something is easy to use, you might give like a false sense of competency because your program is really easy, but they're not actually learning things. It has to be hard, but hard from like a educational perspective, not from like a user interface perspective. So this is like a code challenge, or we call a lab, and you need to actually write code to make this pass. And there's no place to write code here. And the way a user interacts with this, um, I'm gonna show you kind of like the magic version, which I call a training wheel. I'm gonna click on this button, open, and it's gonna pop up my terminal, and it's gonna ask me if I wanna skip ahead, and then it's gonna fork and clone and open the lesson, and now, boom, I'm in my Atom text editor. 
right? Which is say that, like, I think that if you're going to learn how to program, you should use the same tools that I'm using as a programmer every day. Vim or Sublime or Atom or Emacs, we don't care. I like Atom, so I'm configured to use that. We basically open up the lab, and then we give you a test suite. So I type in learn, which is like a wrapper around our spec, and now you can read the test failures. And I expect you to write a program that printed out this phrase 10 times using the times constructor, and it's not working, which is I want my beginner developers to get used to this idea of reading error messages and deciphering what they need to build, as opposed to like pressing submit on a REPL and then being like, nope, not it, try again. Right? So they're actually like using these like very real workflows. And then you know, to make this pass, I'm just going to copy in my solution. And then I would run learn again. And it would run my test suite again. And now it's all green, and I'm happy. And you can kind of see that the platform is kind of tracking my progress. So it knew that I forked the lab. It knew that I ran my local test suite, and now it's working. But I'm not done yet. I have to submit it. So I'm going to type in learn submit. And um, what it's basically doing is it's staging my, my commits, it's committing them, it's pushing them to GitHub, it's opening a pull request up for me. So the way a student submits a lab on Learn is by submitting a pull request against our student deployed version. And now the lab is done, and I can move on. So that's kind of like the simple user experience, and we call that a training wheel, because ultimately I don't want people doing that all the time. At some point when you're learning how to program, you must learn how to use Git. And if you know Chris Granger from like Eve and Lighttable, Chris and I like to argue about this pedagogy a lot. He calls things like the terminal and Git an incidental complexity to learning how to program. I mean, does anyone not use Git on a daily basis? Okay, well you guys use some sort of version control, I imagine, which say that I don't think that Git and the terminal and bash is an incidental complexity to learning how to program. I very much think those are part of the craft. You must learn them. <laughs> okay, I cannot wait to hear about that, um, and I will argue with you all you want. Um, so yeah, so then like if you go to another lab, what's really cool about the way we built Learn is that it's really just you know this giant kind of integration with GitHub. So here's a lab, and the other way I can start working on this lab is by like actually going to the lab on GitHub, and then I can like fork it and basically take all the steps manually, right? And then I can clone it down. So that, you know, I want to make it easy for people to use, but I don't want to contrive it to the point where they're not actually learning anymore, which is, I think, how most people approach making products for people to learn. All right, and then I can type in learn, and then whatever, I'm not going to actually, like, whatever. Push it back up to GitHub, and then submit my pull request. So say that, like, the same workflow, we're moving the training wheels totally works in that we've just automated all these steps via like that open button and that learn submit command, but you can always remove those training wheels. And I guess from a product perspective, I think that you can build a tricycle, and the tricycle is awesome because you get on it and you can ride and it's really great, but then you learn how to ride and you're like, oh my god, I'm stuck on this stupid tricycle and that sucks. I wanted to build a bike with training wheels that it's easy to use at first, but the second you get a sense of the workflow, you can start removing the training wheels and get like a real velocity and like, you know, use real tools. So that's kind of like the first pedagogy behind Learn was we want people using real tools when they're learning how to program. No contrived environments or workspaces or like, you know, I don't want to make it easier. I want to make it easier, but not like by removing the, like the, the specialness of being a developer and having these amazingly powerful workflows. And then because it's all Git-based, any student on the platform can do what I'm about to do, which is I'm reading this and I'm a terrible speller, as I imagine a lot of you are. Cool, let's all fix a typo. Because it's all, all of our content is actually just stored in GitHub, like you can actually contribute to our curriculum in the same way you would submit a pull request to any sort of like open source project, right? So that I can like, you know, whatever, I'll have to undo this, but hi, and I have merge rights, so I'll merge this to master, and in like a few minutes, this will, lab will actually update with that new content so that everybody that is reasoning, all of our students can basically contribute to our curriculum, make it better through the same workflow that like contributes to all of open source, pull requests. So like if you open up this lab, I'm sure it's already closed by now, but, you know, there was, like that was like a pull request by a student where they changed those things in the spec to make it more readable and things like that. So that because all of the content on Learn is actually Git-based, you can like edit the content really quickly and it's this open curriculum that's like really dynamically evolving. And then I guess the last part, um, you know, 
when you kind of get stuck as a programmer or you're trying to learn how to program, you go to like this like Udacity forum that's like asynchronous and like you're like, hey, I don't understand this, and then maybe or maybe not someone responds. But like if you're stuck over here, you just be like, hey, can anyone help? And that just went to like all the students, and like you know, we can actually chat and have a dialogue about what you don't understand, and let's screen share and let's remote pair and use Screen Hero and things like that. So that like, oh, cool, there's someone responding. So that like, it kind of like blows my mind that no one thought about like, oh, let's just put real time chat over like Udacity or over Code Academy, but they haven't done that. And like, I think that watching my students learn in person, it's all about dialogue and like the, the way that they converse and talk about code, you know is how they learn. And I think that like these ideas of like Stack Overflow, because I go to Stack Overflow and I don't actually read anything. I look for the snippet to copy and paste because I know what I'm doing. But to beginners, the dialogue of trying to understand what's going on is crucial. And like giving people answers robs them of that opportunity to learn. So I guess kind of like, okay. Um, so I guess like those are kind of like the three pedagogies of like how we like to teach which is I want you to use real tools, so no REPLs. I want there to be like an open curriculum that everyone can contribute to that like makes the depth and breadth of our curriculum just so much more immersive than anything like on Udacity. And then I wanted there to be like a community and a social aspect to it so that I can like see like who's completed this lab recently and like actually reach out to them and be like, hey, I saw that you solved this yesterday. Can we chat about it? I don't understand how this worked and things like that. And actually like bring people together to learn together online. So yeah. I don't know, I had 15 minutes, I don't know how long that was. But that's Learn, and uh, you know, I'm a Rubyist. If you guys have any questions about like how Learn works, or our pedagogy, or Flatiron School, super happy to answer them. I don't know if we're doing a Q&A or what, but that's kind of what, I, that's what I've got. Yeah.